senator, and he's currently the director of the Hugh L. Carey Institute for Government Reform at Wagner College. And Robert Polner is a former reporter for Newsday, who is now working as a public affairs officer for New York University and its Wagner F. Uh, uh, sorry, Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Gentlemen, thanks very much for joining me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, for inviting us. Well, now it's interesting. Hugh Carey is a fascinating character. In, in first, because we see him frequently, or we used to in Albany, he comes up or for, all the time for State of the State. But he's pretty much an unsung hero of New York, and that's that's really what this book is all about. Uh, Senator, if you wouldn't mind telling us how you came to write this book and decided that he was someone that needed to be brought to light. Well, uh, your opinions were echoed by people uh, in Albany when I was senator, and uh, especially um, academics at the universities and also in the Albany archives when I dec we decided we might do this. We were told that uh, though Nelson Rockefeller and Mario Cuomo had a great deal written about them, and they wrote a great deal, there was very little written about you carry and in a cursory review of uh, the man and his uh, achievements I said this has to be corrected and of course uh, at that point I met with Governor Carey and uh, the president of my college was there and he agreed to do that and the next thing was to get a, uh, a uh, very competent excellent uh, co-author and researcher and that was Rob Polner and we started this project three years ago it's and you, taken a long time and you actually Rob did you interview Governor Kerry or did both of you interview Governor Kerry uh, how did that work the way we sorted it out is I actually did ten very extensive and really very memorable interviews with Governor Kerry he uh, was vivid he's a wonderful storyteller uh, a lot of the strengths of the book are in uh, are, in, are in the parts where he was very descriptive, his early years, his time running for Congress. He served seven terms in Congress and he was appointed to the House Ways and Means Committee in 1970. His campaign in 1974, he started out for governor, he started out known by 5% of the state electorate, not really well known except within his own conservative uh, congressional district in Brooklyn. And, uh, and despite a pretty significant, I think, record of achievement in Congress, and he went on to uh, barely get on the ballot in the Democratic primary and to defeat the whatever everyone thought was the hands-on uh, favorite, who was Howard Samuels, in, in the primary, and then to end 16 year, straight years of Republican dominance of the state under Rockefeller and his successor, uh, Malcolm Wilson. You know, Kerry came between, uh, as Seymour mentioned, Kerry came between two huge figures in New York State, Rockefeller and uh, Mario Cuomo. He's sometimes, I think, underappreciated, but what he achieved during the New York City fiscal crisis of 1975, when the banks, uh, the major banks, tightened credit and just were fearing that the city would go into default under its massive debt and it's uh, slowing cash flow in a harsh recession. Uh, he, he stepped in and uh, he persuaded mo uh, bankers, labor union leaders, Democrats, Republicans, people at all levels of government, and he was very familiar with those levels of government and many others, that this was not a, uh, or the result of a passing kind of temporary cyclical downturn but was a genuine intractable financial crisis that threatened not just New York City which he felt should never be allowed to go into bankruptcy but really the fiscal future of the entire state and he and the public believed him by and large which is very striking, I think, looking back. Well, you know, pretty astonishing. Interestingly, uh, I, be, that, I hope, just oh. I'm sorry, but just before Senator, because I, I just want to also ask you, you speak in this book, in the in the preface of the book or the in, the introduction, as as a cautionary tale almost. I mean, we're seeing a lot of these figures are still right. around. I mean, Richard Ravitch well, is still around. Yes. He's the lieutenant governor well, of New York. One of the reasons, yeah. One of the reasons, Liz, is he chose the best and the brightest. And many of these best and brightest did not have prior political experience 
They came from different states. Uh, he did not know them. Uh, one of them, a, a prominent one who uh, is now lieutenant governor, uh, played tennis with Howard Samuels and uh, eventually wound up as a key player in the Kerry administration. Uh, Peter Goldmark came from Massachusetts. What he had the guts to do is look around throughout the country, get the very best people for the job when he realized that New York City and state were on the verge of bankruptcy and as Rob said, the domino effect could impact upon the other 49 states. And he gave them the ball to run with. He set the goals and he supported them down the line. And he brought in public life, you know, people who went on to even greater heights afterwards, like Felix Rowerton, uh, I, and I had mentioned Peter Goldmark and Dick Ravitch and uh, Judah Gribbets uh, but and, uh, and Steve Berger. And he was an extraordinary man because he did not care if these people had more knowledge than he had. Mm. He gave them the publicity and he gave them the, uh, the wherewithal to achieve what they wanted to do and he supported them down the line. Senator, it takes a very strong person to do that. Do you not see, I'm sure both of you see, the parallels of what's happening now and what happened then? I mean, we're talking about a time when uh, New York State was battling with Washington, the famous headline of, you know, Ford to City mm -hmm. drop dead. You're seeing now Washington rejecting FMAP money that the state needs desperately to keep its budget alive. It's not you know, teetering on the, on the edge of bankruptcy, but there are all of these lessons learned, and Richard Ravitch, that you just mentioned him, is sort of out there telling everyone that the state is really in dire fiscal uh, st straits, and yet no one's really listening. And so I wonder, Rob, yeah. if you can say what you see in this book that's happening that, managed, that Hugh Carey managed to get done that we can't get done today at the state level. Well, President Ford said until the state and the city engage in a great deal of sacrifice and self-help, he, he would not even consider federal assistance. Ford actually wanted to see the city first go into a default before he would even consider uh, an ass assistance, but um, luckily it didn't go all that way. He, uh, Carey persuaded him not to allow the city to go into default and bankruptcy, which he felt would have been extremely disruptive at the very least. Uh, the stimulus money is, is, is drying up. It may or may not be re renewed. That's a parallel. The need for uh, political leadership at the state and city levels to, to, that will result in the citizenry really accepting that this is an entrenched and intractable fiscal crisis at the state level now, no longer an imminent bankruptcy, of course, of the, as it was in 1975 of the city, meaning that... Now, something else that's very important, states, Rob, Go ahead. Yeah. Something else that's very, something else that's very well, important. As you I know, I serve five that, terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go, finish. I'm but sorry, Rob. Five finish five it up. Hold on. I was just yeah. going to say that what I mean by intractable is that the state is now making a huge force to make trade-offs, and this is going to continue for the foreseeable future between roads and schools, and between. Uh, health care and law enforcement expenditures. This isn't going to end any time without serious structural uh, changes and you could argue perhaps also uh, federal assistance might become necessary and not just in New York but across the country. Mm -hmm. And that's something the public has to wake up to and for whatever reason they're not buying it now when, it, when it's being, uh, when Governor Patterson is talking about it or, or others. I'm sorry, Senator, go ahead. Okay, uh, as you know, I'm both a politician and a professor and academic, and uh, I served five terms in the New York State Senate, and I'm going to be very candid. Uh, Rob and I wrote another book four years ago called Three Men in a Room. I remember uh, it. The politics of Corruption, Right, and State Government. It is much, much worse today than it was four years ago. Well, why is much that? Much worse. And, well, um, Interesting. I spoke, I had an interview with Warren Anderson just before he passed away, and he said the civility and the stature of the people in a legislature had declined. And he said when um, Governor Carey came before the Republican conference in the Senate, 
And in the assembly, of course, the Democrats with Fred Orenstein and uh, uh, Stanley Steingart and then Stanley Fink, they worked together as a team. They respected the executive office of government. And the executive office of government, though they had differences with the state legislature, respected them. And they, because of that, they compromised and they worked together to save the state. And that was one of the great achievements of Governor Hugh Carey, that he took disparate and different groups, not only in society, as Rob correctly has said, but in state government. And that is what is lacking today. Do you not think, you know, this book also is um, a very positive view of, of Governor Kerry's legacy. And there are some things uh, later on in his tenure, you know, he lost, he didn't run for re-election for a third term. He lost a lot of support in the polls. He had some personal issues. His marriage was annulled. He was seen a little bit as a joke in the press. I mean, is that part of the problem? Is that towards the end of his tenure, that's what people remember instead of those days when he he did this un really unusually powerful thing and was such a, a strong leader. And to that end, perhaps now, and Rob, if you want to go here, uh, we don't have that kind of leadership in Albany. Well, I do think that the press, um, starting around 1977, uh, became more interested in the personal lives of, of, of the politicians and were m much more willing to write about them and sort of use them as fodder. People magazine uh, came of age, and the the public appetite for this kind of story really grew. And at the same time, um, I think there was a genuine amount of fiscal crisis fatigue in the press. They were probably looking for for a more colorful story. And 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 Carrie took his took his lumps in the press as a result. He also uh, put his foot in his mouth at times. And he yes, he as you mentioned, he had uh, uh, personal. Uh, issues as we all do, and those uh, started to dominate the story. But what I found is that he had tremendous uh, achievements as he was uh, in digging the city and the state out of the economic doldrums of those years. There's a lot of uh, extraordinary achievements that he could he could point to, and I do mention some of them in the book, even though the frame of the book is really. Uh, looking at 1975, 1976, when this cr crisis that had really international dimensions hit. It's also actually in there. I would, I would even go, I would even go a step further. And I think it's an important step, uh, and I think Rob would agree with me. The greatness of Governor Carey, and we consider him one of the great governors in the 20th and 21st century, is when there was a major problem. Mm. He rose to the occasion of tackling it and resolving it as best as he could. And that's very, very unusual. Now, there were, you know, issues, minor issues that, you know, Rob had mentioned uh, during uh, the second administration that he had, and without major problems that he had during the first administration. And when, however, when you add up all of the issues and all of the achievements, one has to admit this was an extraordinarily gifted government, a uh, governor. Of course he had warts. All of us have warts. But he comes up smelling like roses. And, uh, and that's I actually him, that's actually very apt that, <laughs> because that was what his favorite yeah, line was. That was they, that's right, in his inaugural address, a days of wine, wine and roses are over. But I really think that he rose to the occasion that needed a great governor to uh, resolve. That, and, um, uh, he also, and I'm, I actually am going to have to give you the last word there, Senator, but uh, this, this book is available now, is it not? And I'm, I'm sure you're probably going to be doing some publicity around the state. Yes, we are, as yeah, a matter of fact. Both of us uh, have appeared on various programs, and it, you know, we could... Uh, uh, be purchased uh, in bookstores as well as Amazon.com and uh, BarnesandNoble.com, and both Rob, uh, Rob and I will be going around the state uh, in the next couple of months, and uh, you'll probably be seeing articles uh, in other newspapers, upstate and downstate, and other interviews. But we really are enjoying this interview with you, Liz. <laughs> well, and I want. Thank you.